this weekend starts, as I mentioned just a moment ago, this weekend starts the um, uh, beginning of a special season in the life of the church. When I say the life of the church, I don't just mean Stonebridge Community Church, but the universal Christian church, the, the church of Jesus Christ. This is the season of Advent. The season of Advent is a four-week period of preparation during which the church looks forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Advent is not about the coming of Christmas. Advent is about the coming of Jesus Christ. And not just his arrival, his first arrival as a baby in Bethlehem, but also his promised return in glory at a day and at an hour that no one but God the Father knows. Now, in addition to, to being the first weekend in Advent, this also marks the start of a new season in the life of Stonebridge Community Church as I prepare to step down at the end of this month after almost 30 years as your pastor. And I see the start of Advent and the beginning of this new season in the life of Stonebridge as really kind of a fortunate and not altogether accidental confluence of events. And it's why I, I've chosen to start my final message series here, a series that I'm calling Prepare the Way of the Lord, by focusing on the words of John the Baptist in John 3.30, who says of Jesus, he must become greater, I must become less. That's really the big idea in my message today. Uh, there's no reason to bury the lead. I'm just going to put it up front. That's the big idea. As we prepare to say our goodbyes over the next few weeks, with gratitude to God for all that we have shared together, it's really important for us all to know and to remember and keep at the forefront of our minds, he must become greater. I must become less. Um, John the Baptist was, was really a, an, extraordinary, um, an extraordinary person. Uh, and I'm not sure that he gets the credit and the respect and the attention that he deserves. Because of the New Testament and Jesus himself clearly hold him in incredibly high regard. No single human being, uh, with the possible exception of Joseph and Mary, had a greater impact on Jesus' life and on his ministry than John the Baptist. And Jesus himself says this. He publicly announces it in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 7, when, when he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. I just wonder how many of us think of John the Baptist as, uh, as Jesus did, with this kind of, uh, of high regard. Uh, when, when the word of the Lord first came to, to John, the voice of prophecy had been silent in Israel for around 400 years. So when John burst upon the scene somewhere around 28 AD, people really took notice. Uh, dressed in, in clothing made of camel's hair, wearing a, a leather uh, belt, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John drew enormous crowds because people recognized this was the voice of prophecy reborn. He was like Elijah. He looked like Elijah. He sounded like Elijah. And people knew that before the Messiah returned, Elijah was going to return to prepare the way for him. And so John drew enormous crowds. People traveled to the wilderness to hear this urgent and this uncompromising message that John had to declare. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he, Matthew writes in Matthew 
chapter 3. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John, John holds a really important place in all four Gospels. His disciples, even after his death, his disciples are still mentioned in the book of Acts. The great uh, Jewish historian, Josephus, writes about John the Baptist. We have extra-biblical uh, testimony to the importance of, of John the Baptist in the life of the people of Israel during that time. It's so interesting, as you look at the Gospels, in, in all four Gospels, in each one, John is doing pretty much the same thing. He is preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's interesting that when we read this, for the forgiveness of sins, um, you know, outside of the church, the word sin really has, has fallen into disuse, if not disfavor. It's not that we totally neglect it, but we... Uh, we kind of use it in, in a, a flippant way. You know, Vegas is Sin City, and people laugh about that. Or, you know, chocolate cake is, you know, our little sin that we have. Um, but I tell you something, I think we're really missing out on a really important um, biblical concept that impacts each and every one of our lives when we forget what sin really is, viewed in its original context. You know, when John the Baptist talks about a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin, sin is a strong, it is a robust, and it is an irreplaceable word. It's irreplaceable. An irreplaceable word that describes a stubborn fact about human experience that I think each and every one of us understands and can relate to. When the Bible talks about sin, it is describing a demonstrable fact about human life and the world in which we live. It's something we can all see. It's something uh, that, whose impact we have all experienced. Because I don't think there's a single person here today who would disagree with what I'm about to, to say. As we look around at the world today, things are not working the way they're supposed to. We live in a world where we are estranged. We're estranged from, from God. And what are the signs, some of the signs that we're estranged from God? There, one sign is that there are a lot of people who don't even believe there is a God. Another sign that we are estranged from God is that there are countless people who believe that God is angry with us. Or that he doesn't care. We are estranged from God. We're estranged from one another. And, and I think we can see that in our lives. It's a reason why even in the best of marriages, in the best of friendships, there's always friction and conflict. It's why there is division within our nation, with the nations everywhere. That's why there's conflict around the world. We are estranged from God. We are estranged from one another. And truth be told, we're even estranged from ourselves. One of the things I appreciate so much about the Bible is, uh, is the biblical realism, the way in which it is able to just look truth in the face and, and admit the Apostle Paul says, for instance, the good that I would do, I find myself not doing. And stuff I don't want to do, that I do. He describes himself as, you know, kind of a wretched person, and he asks, who can deliver me from this? And we're, that's where we all are. We... We have aspirations and ideals, and none of, them, uh, none of us lives up to them. We know we each have a sense of right and wrong, and, uh, and even though we have a clear sense of right and wrong, 
none of us really lives up to it fully. This is what the Bible is getting at when it talks about uh, sins. To make matters worse, we aren't passive victims of this estrangement. It's not like it just happens to us. Each and every one of us actively participates in and contributes to it in a thousand different ways. Some of them obvious, some of them subtle. If you've ever gone, um, you know, gone home after saying something that you regret, you know, and asking, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I knew that, I knew what the outcome, and you still do it anyway. We're strange from ourselves. Now, when the Bible des describes sins, of course, it's describing the outward manifestation of that. When it talks about sin, it's talking about where that comes from, not just the symptoms, not just the manifestations, but the source of it, and the source of it is our hearts. Because our hearts are not um, inclined toward God, but towards ourselves, each and every one of us. I mean, we go through life, and I, I think this is a demonstrable fact, too. We go through life because everything seems to be centered around me at any given moment, because I'm in the center of my own experience, it's easy to conclude it must all be about me. And the world is filled with people, each and every one of whom believes it's all about me. It, you know, everything revolves around me, and we're all wrong. Because it all centers around God. And our forgetting that is yet another manifestation of this brokenness about which John the Baptist is preaching. Now, what, what impresses me um, as I think about this is how John can preach so uncompromisingly and so clearly about the reality of sin, its devastation, uh, the, the devastation that it wreaks in our lives. He can talk about sin and be so wildly popular. People travel to the wilderness. They journey to hear him talk about sin. Mark, Mark writes, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. And why did, he, why did they do that? I mean, somebody you know, put signs around town and said, hey, you should come and hear, you know, this person's going to talk about sin. I don't know how many people would show up. But they showed up to hear John. And why, why was that? I, I have a hunch. I, I think maybe it, it has something to do uh, with the fact that the biblical concept of sin takes our moral agency so seriously. What do I mean by that? This biblical idea of sin assumes that what each and every one of us does matters. It matters. The attitudes that we hold, the beliefs that we embrace, the words that we speak, the views we espouse, the actions that we take are actually important. That they matter. That our choices carry something approaching eternal meaning and significance. This is not necessarily the message of the world because what we're so often told is it doesn't matter what you believe. And that's true for you, but it's not for me. And that's no big deal. And you know what? If you hear that message uh, long enough, suddenly you begin to believe, I guess it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how we treat one another. It doesn't matter the views that we hold. It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what we do. You hear that enough and you begin to believe it. And if enough people begin to believe it, everything goes south. This is what John the Baptist saw. God gave John the eyes to see it. And he put him into the Judean wilderness to proclaim that message. That that's wrong. 
Your life does matter. The choices you make matter. He spoke God's truth into their lives when he confronted the reality that we all make poor choices. And those poor choices have devastating consequences, whether we want to recognize it or not. They dishonor God. They dishonor other people. They do dishonor to us. Sin's a real thing. And John the Baptist proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if, if sin is the problem, what's the solution? Well, John offers a first step, and it's not the final step. It is necessary, but it's not sufficient. A first step in the transformation of our lives and the transformation of the world. John offers repentance as the first step. You know, repentance is another word that's kind of fallen into disuse. It's fallen into disfavor. But I'd argue once again, repentance, like sin, is a strong and it is a robust and it is an important and it is an irreplaceable word. Because it it describes something important. It describes a healthy process in which we should all be involved if things are ever going to be better. Uh, In Greek, the the Greek word metanoia that's translated repent or repentance means to change your mind. Uh, the, The Hebrew word that's translated repentance means to turn around. And basically the idea is that Uh, It's not just our attitudes and our actions, but it's our hearts. The trajectory, the direction of, of the loyalty of our hearts is really away from God, and it is toward sin. And it's only when we recognize that we're heading in the wrong direction that we can see what the solution is. And the solution is not... See, a lot of us think that our problem is that we're trying the best that we can and we're not getting the results we want, and so we need to try harder to get to where we need to go. What repentance reminds us of, if we're going away from God, you can work twice as hard and you'll just get twice as far from God. It's not until you turn around that you turn from sin and to God that you're going to find the solution. And that's why I would argue, you know what repentance is? Spiritual common sense. If you're not going where you want to go, you know the best thing to do is stop heading in that direction and turn around. Repentance involves abandoning the pretense or the illusion of innocence. The pretense or illusion that we're victims Repentance means coming clean. It refers to redirecting the trajectory of our hearts. Away from sin, away from self, back to God where it belongs. And that was the call. That was the call of John, of God on John the Baptist's life. Preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. When people were baptized by John... That was an outward and visible sign that they were turning back to him. And so John really posed a choice in in his ministry. There were those who were baptized, those who turned from sin, those who turned back to God, and those who chose not to and made their choice. And, And John's Uh, proclaiming this this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins was a means of preparing his people for and pointing them toward the ultimate solution. And that was the coming of Jesus Christ for our salvation. 
John was, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for him. Now that was John's unique, irreplaceable vocation. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. But his vocation can remind us that we have our own unique calling too. We each have a part to play in the plan of God. No less than John. Um, I've had a, a part to play in the plan of God, for which I'm really grateful. I have been blessed beyond measure by having had the privilege of playing a part in the plan of God here at Stonebridge Community Church for almost 30 years now. And what I want to remind you today is that no less than, than John, no less than me, you have a part to play in the plan of God that is no less important. Because we're the body of Christ and each one individually members of it. And there is no one part of the body that is more important than the other. They all have to work together. And when one suffers, they all suffer. And when one part is ill, it affects the entire body. All the parts matter as we rely on one another to do those things that God has uniquely entrusted to our care and that God has uniquely equipped us to do. Every single one of, of you has a ministry. This is, this is the great, um, this is the idea between, behind the great Reformation concept of the priesthood of all believers. Well, over the years I've seen some folks here at our church kind of misunderstand that because they they think, oh, if I'm priesthood of believers, I could do all, anything I want to in the church or whatever. That, that's not true. Not everyone is called to ordination as minister of word and sacrament. But you know what? What the priesthood of believers says is that we are all called to ministry and service. Like John the Baptist. Like those whose names we read in the great roster of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. You have a part to play in the plan of God. And the part that you have to play in the plan of God is really, really important. In the months ahead, as we call an interim pastor, as we put a pastor nominating committee into place who will spend uh, hours and hours and hours and hours discerning God's will until the congregation is ready to call that person whom God has chosen to be your next senior pastor. In the months ahead, I want to challenge you to step up and to claim your calling to embrace it, to not just, you know, see your, yourself as a recipient or consumer of worship, but as a member of the body of Christ, uniquely equipped and personally called to make a difference in the world. I want to challenge you to, to contribute to the health and well-being of God's church here at Stonebridge by being faithful in worship because that's important for you. And I'll talk about worship at the end of this message, but it's important for you to be in worship. And it's important for everyone who comes to worship that you're here. It makes a difference. I want to challenge you to, to participate in a growth group. If you've never done it before, now's the time. Because it's in the growth groups that you have an opportunity to, to really figure out the, the 
personal applications of, of each week's messages. You have an opportunity to, to actually do what we are commanded more than five dozen times in the New Testament to pray for one another, encourage one another, edify one another, build one another up. And I want to encourage and, and challenge you to serve, to serve in the church as a teacher, as a youth group leader, as an usher, as a greeter, as a ministry team member. You know, we can learn from John the Baptist's example that we each have a part to play, an irreplaceable part, an important part to play in the plan of God. But having said that, we also can learn from John the Baptist that while we have an important part to play, it's not the central role. You know, just, just as, um, as we have, you know, what, what sin is, this trajectory of the heart where we imagine that everything revolves around us, one of the ways sin manifests itself in the light of, light of the life of the church is uh, this idea that the ministry that is most important to you ought to be the ministry that's most important to everybody else. And it's easy to become very judgmental or to say, well, you know, if you really love Jesus, they'd be doing what I'm doing. No, they're doing other stuff that's just as important. And my question would be, why aren't you doing that? That's why we're the body of Christ. We need one another. You complete me. <laughs> you know, uh, um, we each have an important part to play, but it's not the central role. That belongs to somebody else. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we finished this message series called Selfies of the Savior, in which we were looking at the great I am, seven great I am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am, Jesus said, the light of the world. I'm the door to the sheepfold. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. That was all about Jesus' own self-awareness, how he understood himself. In this week's message, I want to call your attention to the great I am saying of John the Baptist, who says in John 3, 28, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. but I'm sent ahead of him. You know, that's one of the things we need to remember, that there is a Messiah, and it's not us. It's interesting to, to see how uh, John the Baptist is portrayed in, in paintings, and uh, I'll give you a little, a little bit of an art appreciation lesson here, very short. I would refer you to your U version notes this week um, because there is a great 10 part video series, very short videos, but a 10 part video series um, that I gave you a link to um, that basically has a couple of people from the National Gallery in London who go through the gallery and just talk about pictures of John the Baptist, starting with pictures of his infancy all the way through his untimely death. And it, it's interesting stuff. But it fascinates me how John is por portrayed in paintings, in, in many of them. You know what he's doing? He is pointing. And one of the ways that if you go to an art museum and you see, you know, a, a picture that is obviously of, of, of biblical content, if you see a figure in, in that picture or that painting that's pointing, it is most likely John the Baptist. He points to prophecies. He points to a lamb. He points to heaven. He points to the cross. And you know what he's doing? Always, one way or another, 
He's pointing to Jesus. That's why he was called. Do you get the point? In, in today's text, John uh, actually likens himself to the best man at a wedding. And, um, you know, if you've ever been a, a best man, one of the things you realize is that you have an important uh, part to play, but you can be replaced. If you get sick, the wedding's not going to come crashing to a halt. Because you're not the groom. You have a really important part to play, uh, but it's not about you. It's about the bridegroom. And in today's uh, scripture reading, John likens himself to the best man at a wedding, the friend who attends the bridegroom, who waits and listens for him, and who is full of joy when he hears his voice. John, John understands that he has an important part to play, but it's not the central role. John knows that he has been called to point people to Jesus. And that's really been my calling here at Stonebridge Community Church. It has been the point of every sermon that I have delivered. And I'm gonna, I won't minimize the importance of my role. I know I've been here for 30 years and I've touched a lot of people's lives. But it's always been in a supportive role. It has been my prayer for longer than I can remember. And you've heard me pray it week after week after week that I could step aside so that the sole attention, sole focus of our attention would be on God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and I will tell you, one of the hardest uh, parts of this transition to retirement for me has been all the attention I've been getting. It makes me feel really uncomfortable. Not that I don't appreciate it. I understand. And I appreciate it, and I'm grateful for it. But I, I just want you to know, there's a part of me, it feels awkward because a bit like John the Baptist, I, I've really invested my whole life in pointing other people to Jesus. And when people start making it about me, it just feels awkward. I'm shy. I'm awkward at parties. And it's only because of my calling to pro proclaim Christ that I'm able to stand up here week after week and share the good news with you. So when it's about me, it's really awkward. And that's part of the reason why I've chose today's text to, to start this series. He must become greater. I must become less. You know, I've had people say, and this breaks my heart, people say, I don't know if I'll keep coming to Stonebridge after you're gone. Don't say that. That is the worst thing that you can say to me. That is not a compliment. To me, that, that speaks of my failure as your pastor. Because it is not about me and it has never been about me. He must become greater. I must become less. And that's a healthy thing. That's a good thing. You know, Jesus himself said, I have to leave you. He said this to his disciples on the night of, of his arrest. He said, I have to leave you, but I'm leaving you for good reason so the Holy Spirit can come, the comforter. The things that I'm doing, greater things will you do because I go to the Father. As Jesus let go and as his disciples let go of Jesus, God was faithful. And God's faithful to us today. He must become greater. I must become less. Those words challenge us and those words invite us 
to do something really important, and that is to focus all of our attention and glory and honor and praise to Jesus Christ. Because our common calling as Christians, whether ordained clergy or members of the church, is to magnify Jesus. That's our calling as Christians. When we teach Sunday school classes, why do we do it? To magnify Jesus. When you serve as an usher or as a greeter at the hub, in the worship team, the tech team, as you serve as, as leaders of small groups, as you go out to serve the community through Ashley Manor or the Christmas shop or the Heart of Christmas offering, why do we do that? To magnify Jesus. My prayer for Stonebridge Community Church is that you will follow the worthy example of John the Baptist and trusting God with the future that you will prepare the way of the Lord. And how did John prepare the, the way of the Lord? By bearing witness to Jesus, by magnifying Jesus, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door to the sheepfold, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. I want to challenge you to make a commitment to be in worship when the new year rolls around. And I'll tell you why. Because worship is first and foremost about magnifying Jesus. Worship is first and foremost about loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to, I want to really offer a, a challenging and prophetic word to you guys today. Because I think that the church in North America today is making a terrible mistake in thinking that worship is about us. And we do. Because that's why people shop around for churches. Where, where can I get what I'm looking for? That is just another manifestation of the sin of which we ought to repent because worship is not about us. Worship is giving all honor and glory and praise to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Being in worship is important for you. It is encouraging to other people, and above all else, it honors God. You know, I can barely make it through a message without referring to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis hated organ music. He hated hymns. He really didn't think that the pastor of the church gave particularly good messages. I don't blame him. He's C.S. Lewis, for gosh sakes. <laughs> but he was at church every week because he knew it wasn't about him. It was about honoring God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our worship points us. And by the way, our worship is a witness, and it points others to Jesus. It magnifies Jesus. Our common calling as Christians is to magnify the Lord. And that is the heart of worship. It is not about you. It is not about me. It is about giving glory to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He must increase. I must decrease. And you know what, that's, that's true for you. As you think about worship, he must increase. And each one of us needs to decrease. It's true for John. It is true for me. And it is true for us all. So magnify Christ in worship and magnify Christ in the way that you show love to one another. The way that you show love to our community. The way that you show love to lost people you know, people who are disconnected from Christ and His church, who have no meaningful relationship with the church right now. 
you have a unique calling, and it's to point people to Jesus, no less than John the Baptist did. You know, if, if I were to identify one uh, area of my ministry that has been most important to me in which I wish I had been able to do a better job, I wish that I had been able to find the key to unlock your hearts so that you would care for lost people enough to love them and invite them to know Christ. I'm your pastor today because somebody did that for me. And who knows how God could use you if you were willing to do that for them.